in this section, we'll have a, sort of an overview of the foreign policy of President Jimmy Carter, who followed Ford in 1976 and was president through the 1980 election. Carter made it clear from the start of his foreign policy that he was going to do things differently than Nixon and Ford. He rejected realpolitik. He saw the United States as a force for good in the world. Now, he wanted to introduce a moral component in American foreign policy, which he believed would uh, win support abroad, and it wouldn't counter American ideals. So, as part of that, Carter sought additional aid for developing countries. He, he cut defense spending, and he stressed respect for human rights. He even created a new assistant secretary of human rights in the State Department. Carter ordered the removal of nuclear missiles from South Korea, believing that they increased tensions in the region. Carter ended American support of the brutal but Western allied regime of Anastasio Somoza in Nicaragua, and after the left-leaning rebel group the Sandinistas won in 1979, he uh, resumed support uh, of Nicaragua, hoping to moderate and influence the Sandinistas, the new regime. Carter criticized South Africa for its racial apartheid policies and helped promote a biracial election in Rhodesia, which led to the modern nation of Zimbabwe. When, however, Abel Musaria won the election, Carter refused to meet with him, believing him a brutal right-wing dictator. Carter ins insisted that the election was invalid uh, because not all components of Rhodesian society participated, including rebels led by Robert Mugabe, who later took power and proved equally controversial. Concluding years of discussions, Carter signed two Panama Canal treaties in 1977. One transferred the canal from American to Panama at the end of December 1999, and the other assured that the canal would always remain open and that the U.S. reserved the right to intervene should the canal ever be closed. While the canal perfectly represented Carter's desire to stress human rights and sort of correct historical wrongs, conservative Republicans in Congress were very upset. And uh, nevertheless, the, the treaties were finally ratified in 1978. And indeed, at the end of 1999, into the millennium, the, canals, the canal was transferred to Panamanian control. Carter did continue Nixon's efforts at detente, proposing that the American and Soviets further cut the number of missile launchers and MIRV intercontinental ballistic missiles that had been cut according to Ford's 74 agreement. The Soviets protested the cuts too severe for them, and negotiations continued throughout the Carter presidency. Finally, in a summit meeting in Vienna, Austria in 1979, America and the Soviet Union concluded an agreement that became known as the Strategic Arms Limitation Talks II. Sought two. The treaty set a limit of 2,400 long-range missiles and bombers for each side at the time of signing, and they agreed to reduce this number to 2,250 by the end of 1981. The agreement also restricted the number of total warheads to 10,000 for each nation, of which 1,320 could be MIRVs. Both sides agreed to no more than 10 warheads on any intercontinental missile. The American cruise missile was included in the agreement, but the Soviet bomber was not. Brezhnev did, however, agree to limit the production of these bombers to only 30 per year. Despite Carter signing SALT II, many Republicans believed that Carter had given up the uh, shop. He'd given up too much. A growing number of arch conservatives really distrusted the Soviets and detente in general, believing that the Soviets, they wouldn't live up to their agreements. You couldn't trust them as far as you could throw them. In the end, Congress never ratified the SALT II agreement, much to Carter's dismay. Ratification was difficult because only months after the agreement, the Soviets invaded Afghanistan. In 1978, a coup had toppled a pro-Soviet government in Afghanistan, which of course shared a long border with the Soviet Union. And the Soviets feared an Islamic-led rebellion not only in Afghanistan, but in its nearby Islamic areas, which the Soviets had. And, and therefore, the Soviets invaded Afghanistan in 1979, which really angered the United States. In a highly controversial decision, Carter decided to boycott the 1980 Summer Olympics in the protest of this invasion. Of course, the Soviets reciprocated because the United States was hosting the 84 Summer Olympics in L.A., and so the Soviets ended up boycotting that. Probably more important in the long span of history, but it was during the Soviet occupation of uh, Afghanistan in the 1980s that the U.S. began covert support 
uh, of the Islamic opposition to the Soviet occupation. And, uh, you know, it was in this aid to the uh, Islamic radicals that were fighting the Soviets that we trained Osama bin Laden, who uh, later, of course, would famously turn against the United States in 9-11. As I've mentioned uh, in an earlier video, Carter did have more success continuing Nixon and Ford's detente with the People's Republic of China, Communist China, formally recognizing the PRC and beginning full diplomatic relations. I should note uh, that as Carter left office, a new problem emerged when Cuba's Fidel Castro in April 1980 announced that anyone who wanted to leave Cuba could. And then, of course, he opened his prisons. And thousands of criminals left in boats in Mariel Harbor trying to get to Florida. By October 1980, over 125,000 poor and troubled Cuban exiles had flooded into Florida in what became known as the Mariel Boat Lift. The Carter administration struggled to house and feed all these new arrivals, and many of them were violent, and in time, of course, crimes sub subsequently rose. Perhaps you can uh, recall the Al Pacino movie uh, Scarface, in which this, this crime is portrayed. In any event, this includes a section on Carter's uh, foreign policy and how he tried to uh, steer a more uh, human rights approach.